Majora's Mask, Chapter 40, The Healer. It happened as it always did. The clock tower doors opened. The sun blinded him. The people stared at him. Link and Tattle exited the doorway together, but only the boy was grievously wounded. He took one step out, dropped his possession, and fell to one knee. The fairy flew beside him, dismissing the curious expressions of South Clock Town's residents. Link searched for something that wasn't there, trying in vain to overcome his body's agony. Epona, he said, looking at Tattle with wide eyes. Where's Epona? Tattle's face fell with grim realization. We left her, Link said. The ocarina couldn't bring her back with us. You don't know that, she said, turning to the clock tower doors. She could be in there. Link scooted to the doors and pushed them open. Light spilled into the dark room beneath but there wasn't a horse waiting for them, only the room's empty, steady rhythm of churning water. He left the door swing shut and scooted back outside. Look, Tattle said. Maybe she doesn't come back the way we do. Maybe she's in the forest, right? Where we play the song, like the Skull Kid where he goes back in time. Maybe only you and me can come through the door, so it was just us when we walked through the first time. I... Don't. Words failed him. Link felt lightheaded as multiple wounds threatened to do him in for good. What happened? The postman had stepped forward yet again, and he'd asked the same question as always. Tattle flew right into his face. He got hurt, and oh, what's that? Did we come in from that door? Yep, sure did. From where, you ask? From another universe. The postman blinked confusedly in reply. Does that answer all the questions you're about to ask? Tattle, Link said, unable to humor her banter. We have to go check. No, no, you have to see the Great Fairy, she said. We'll check after we've done that. Come on, we have to walk a little bit further. No, Tattle, you don't understand, Link said as the postman faded into the growing crowd surrounding them. She was real. She wasn't a shadow. She was actually a pona. I could tell. She remembered. She was real. Link barely noticed Tattle's hurt expression after he said that. His fairy swallowed whatever reaction came to mind. Link, maybe the Great Fairy will have answers for us. Come on. Okay, Link said. But the Great Fairy is broken. The first Tattle knew, but you don't. The Skull Kid shattered her, and we have to get her stray fairy first. Link trailed off, grasping the clock tower's outer wall to stop him from fainting. It's at the laundry pool, under the bridge. Tuttle nodded, still clearly bothered by his choice of words. I'll, I'll go get it, she said. I'll be right back. She flew away, and Link immediately regretted not apologizing. They were already on shaking ground as it was. One final swing of his pickaxe, and the boulder crumbled. He grinned as the massive rock fell apart at his feet. The passageway to Romani's ranch was finally clear. Two days ago, an earthquake had knocked rubble loose from the cliff sides flanking the road, and it had taken exactly as long to clear it all. Now Milk can make it to Clocktown in time for the carnival. The man thought. His name was Slarp, and he was proud of himself. Generally, he failed at most things and wasn't very intelligent, but such was the curse his mama had placed upon him by giving him a horrible name. Slarp resented the sound of it, as well as his near constant failure, but today he was proud. He'd put his obscenely muscular arms to use. So Clocktown can once again be blessed with succulent cow juice, he thought. Slarp finished his work by hauling the shattered debris out of the road. Before the sun was even up, his job was finished. 
He wiped the sweat from his brow, looking up at the early morning's pink hues with pride. Three days before the carnival, he thought. Mama didn't think I'd get it done in time. He'd proven her wrong yet again. The large man twirled his pickaxe as he walked up the road toward Romani's ranch. People will have slarp to think when they're having drinks at the bar tomorrow night, he thought. Then a horse appeared out of thin air. One second there'd been nothing but an empty road, and the next, Slarp practically ran into the young steed. He stumbled backward, barely catching his balance. His eyes widened as he beheld the magic horse. Her brown coat and white mane were beautiful. The horse had come to exist bent down, as if nuzzling something that was no longer there. The horse straightened herself and looked around slowly, appearing just as confused. This horse just appeared! Slarp thought in bewilderment. It came from nothingness. Slarp stepped toward it, but the horse neighed loudly and galloped around him. He watched it run away, unsure what to do. Were the woods cursed? Did horses frequently appear to scare travelers? Or were the horses invisible until they chose not to be? He hurried down the path, turning away from the galloping horse. It remained in existence, presumably after it left his line of vision. But there's no way to know, he thought. Slarp wasn't a fool enough to be taken advantage of by invisible horses. Then, something walked out of the trees. It was a shadow given life, and bright red eyes found him. Killer's eyes. This time, Slarp couldn't feel his legs. He stared in horror at the monster before him. The cave, the dark being said. Then it walked past Slarp as if he'd never been there, as if it had spoken to someone else. The shadow walked along the path northward and vanished around the next bend like the horse. Slarp screamed, running to Romani's ranch before another demon or invisible horse could threaten him. Link limped, dragging one foot after the next toward North Clocktown's cave. The boy and his fairy passed a small gang of children playing tag, each in either blue or red. They stopped their game to stare at the injured hero, but Link disregarded them. It felt like ages ago that they tormented his Deku scrub self, and he had no intention of testing their generosity today. He followed the dirt path cutting through the northern district's lawn. An orange fairy flew alongside them, though unlike Tattle, she was too large to be contained in her ball of light. She eyed the hero uncertainly as they completed their journey. The great fairy will be able to heal you, young one, she said. She will reward you greatly. Link made a small noise that might have been agreement. Soon, the grass underneath their feet turned to stone, and the fountain's glow replaced Hermina's early morning light. A grand archway led into a large, shallow pool of water. Tall pillars surrounded the fountain glowing a bright white to fill the darkness with wonder. Shimmers of light fell from the hidden ceiling, surrounding the fountain and pathway leading to the fountain's center. Twenty or so fairies identical to their stray floated above the clear water. The one beside them didn't say a word as it flew to join the others. The fairies immediately began to fly in circles as one. Their collective ball of light became smaller and denser until they were an unbroken sphere of orange light. The great fairy soon emerged, looking exactly as marvelous as before and laughing merrily. She floated as if resting luxuriously on an invisible couch. Her long, orange hair floated behind her. The great fairy! Tattle looked up in awe, flying to be closer. Link took off his boots and followed Tattle as best he could, his bandaged feet touching the first of the steps submerged by water. It felt amazing. Its healing properties were already evident on his sore feet. Harper oh, Tattle, and you, kind young one, the great fairy said, somehow matching her voice with the ethereal glow. Thank you for returning my broken and shattered body to normal. I am the great fairy of magic. For now, this is all I can offer you. Allow me to ease your weariness as my token of gratitude. She opened her arms to welcome him forward, 
and Link took a tentative step closer, allowing the warm, still medicine to reach his shins. The great fairy straightened her posture and cupped her hands before her mouth, as if to perform a spell. Link closed his eyes, expected to be lifted off his feet again, and for the orange light to surround him. But it didn't. He remained standing in the water silently, opening his eyes to see that the great fairy had retracted her hands. She looked at him with an entirely new expression. Fear. A chill passed through the fountain's warm, inviting aura. Link's brow wrinkled with confusion. She's looking at me like I'm a parasite, he thought. Tattle flew forward. Great fairy, what is it? She paused, taking a long moment before she answered. I spoke too soon when I offered my gifts. I am sorry, but he cannot be healed. Not when he carries darkness within him. Link wasn't sure how to respond. What? Tattle said in his place. But you healed him before. Link told me. This is the first time I have laid eyes on him. The great fairy said. She healed me before the lightning. Link said with growing realization. Before I was cursed, you possess the Skull Kid's darkness, and I will not have it defile my fountain as the Dark Child tried to do before. Link didn't think he had any willpower left to resist. He took a step backward for a moment, embracing defeat. But, Great Fairy, Tattle said, he's the last person standing between the Skull Kid and Termina. If you heal him now, then he'll die, and the moon will kill all of us, even it does not matter, the great fairy said. If I tried to heal him, the darkness within him would corrupt me and taint this fountain. It has a life of its own, and his sadness and desperation give it power. But I can control it, Link said, stepping back into the water. He tried his best to swallow his growing panic. It took immense effort. I've used it to hurt the Skull Kid. He said that I've tainted his magic. It's not all darkness anymore. The Great Fairy remained floating, looking at him cautiously. Step further into the water, young one. I sense you have a good heart, but I must see if what you say is true. Link nodded, walking down the steps again. This time... He completed his journey to the Great Fairy, standing right below her until his knees were submerged. Tattle remained watching from the fountain's shoreline, framed by the tall and graceful pillars. The boy stood humbly before the legendary fairy, who held his fate in her palms. The Great Fairy lowered her face to bring hers close to his. It was intimidating for such beautiful eyes to become his entire world, but Link faced them nonetheless. Close your eyes, she said. Link took a deep breath and obeyed. The great fairy placed one palm on his forehead and one on his chest, closing her eyes as well. Her touch was powerful, but Link resisted the urge to flee and kept his eyes closed. There is great darkness within you, she said, hands remaining in place. But I could feel that when you stepped into my water. What I couldn't feel before was the light. You have magic in you that is not from the Dark Skull Child, but it is feeble. There is conflict within you, within me. She trailed off, opening her eyes and removing her hands from his forehead, but not the one from his chest. Link opened his eyes, too, to see her fingers directly over his scar, the Skull Kid's mark. It will try to corrupt you she said, returning to her invisible perch. And I don't think the light is strong enough to stop it were I to try and heal you. Your mind is clouded by the darkness. As long as that is the case, it is too dangerous. You have to try, Link said. I wouldn't ask for your help if this was about me. I have to save Termina, and we all have to make sacrifices to win. I think this is your part in the battle. My part is surviving the darkness the Skull Kid put inside of me and destroying his mask. But I can't do that until you've done your part. We can't let him win. Now, please, I can fight the dark magic in me. I've done it before. 
The great fairy's grim expression didn't waver. Very well. But I will not be responsible for what happens. When I channel my magic into you, I will be opening the gates for the darkness to spread. And unless you can stop it, there will not be a me or a you left to save Terminal. And this fountain will be one of darkness. Link looked down into his own pale, haggard reflection. He gulped. I feel so weak, so tired. Shikashi couldn't heal him this time, and the Song of Healing had no mask to seal his injuries into. But what if the Great Fairy was right, and even her magic powerless? Link turned to Tattle, who still floated at the fountain's entrance. The Great Fairy can help you, she reassured him. She's strong enough, I promise. The voice of reason. The voice of caution. If Tattle was telling him he should do it, then he should. But she's a but phantom. She's a phantom. <laughs> the masked salesman's voice said within him. A ghost. A ghost. A ghost. Should you listen, should to, you her? listen to her? <laughs> Link shook his head, facing the great fairy again. <sighs> I'm ready. Very well. The great fairy said, cupping her hands again. Allow me to ease your weariness as a token of my gratitude. Link closed his eyes again, and this time, it happened. He gently levitated out of the water, opening his eyes to see a beam of orange light descending from the dark ceiling. He grew dizzy as the light encircled him and numbed his mind. The magic beckoned him to surrender, and he resisted at first. I can't give in, he thought. What if I slip away forever? What if I die? But he was unable to fight it. As soon as the magic overcame him, his stomach's injury began to tingle and burn. It felt healing. He could feel the magic working. He could feel it in his shoulders, too, as well as his arms and legs. Everywhere, he realized. Energy seeped into his bones where only exhaustion and pain had been. Tattle watched from afar as Link remained suspended in the orange light, and the great fairy kept her eyes closed in concentration, hands cupped. Then, the healing burn reached Link's chest. The floodgates immediately opened, and he felt another familiar sensation. A grim, dark satisfaction. That sensation rushed through him instead, overpowering the great fairy's calm, healing presence. Tattle watched as Link thrust his head back, screaming as his eyes turned purple. The Great Fairy gasped as she watched the orange spiral of light slowly turn violet. The corruption spread upward into the dark ceiling, overshadowing the fairy's magic, and Link continued shrieking in the dark voice of the mask. The great fairy boomed. She tried to pull her hands away, but something invisible restrained her. Tattle watched Link and the great fairy with growing horror. The clear water darkened too, turning black underneath Link and spreading to the healer. Tattle flew into the fountain. Link! She shouted. She went directly in front of the hero's face. Her immediate reaction was revulsion. Link's terrible, chilling shriek was endless, and his eyes were not his own. His blonde hair had faded to white, and there was so much anger and malice etched into his face. Ah! That's not him, she thought. That's Majora. Snap out of it, Tattle said. Wake up, come back! He wouldn't, though. The orange light was now almost entirely purple, and the great fairy recoiled in pain. The healer, through immense effort, finally pulled her hands free, still visibly out of breath. She thrust her arms upward and released a battle cry of her own. <laughs> the new spell caused the purple spiral around Link to harden. The freezing effect snaked down from the ceiling until it surrounded the hero too, transforming the dark magic's ethereal glow into stone. When silence finally fell upon the fountain, Link was frozen in time, alongside the now-hardened magical spiral. His mouth remained open, though his scream was no more. Purple eyes stared emptily up into darkness, his feet still dangling several feet above the water. Tattle stared, 
stunned in the aftermath, she noted the black pool of corruption beneath Link had also stopped spreading. The great fairy looked solemnly upon her handiwork. What? Tattle began choking on the words. What did you do to him? I stopped, I stopped him from, from killing me and himself, she explained. But he can't move. He, he's stuck. I stopped the magic's flow and therefore him. If I had not, we would be gone. But I warned you, the great fairy said, towering over Tattle with a newfound authority. She could only cower in response. Until the light in him grows stronger, I cannot release him. The darkness would overwhelm me. There's nothing I can do. Tattle beheld her trapped friend, frozen in time with Majora's evil coursing through his veins. As soon as the darkness overpowered Link, his mind left the fairy fountain. Suddenly, he stared into a flat plain of ashes, which stretched onward like an ocean along the horizon. A dark, stormy sky grumbled over the lifeless wasteland. Snowhead and the cave were at his back, and he looked beyond Termina with a mixture of fear and hunger. He couldn't tear his eyes away. The Skull Kid beheld his deity's absolution, what awaited everyone in this realm, and he did so through Majora's mask. It looks just like Clock Town after the moon falls, the imp reflected. It's... Beautiful. He thought this despite the fear paralyzing him. It's normal to be afraid of greatness, the Skull Kid thought. I have to overcome that. Lightning flashed above, though nothing stirred to react in the desolate plain. We must teach our new servant to use its tainted magic, Majora said, as if its magic commanded sound itself. The shadow has something we do not. Its mixture of light and dark must be used against the boy. This was the first time Majora had spoken in hours. That's why I'm bringing the shadow here, the Skull Kid said. I'm bringing it to the ashes. No. Reach our servant now. Connect to the shadow. And show him the power that awaits. The shadow will be here soon. We don't have to. Don't be afraid. Enter the ashes. Remember, they soothe you. The imp gulped, shivering as he took in the plane before him. He stepped towards it, dipping his toes in the ashes. The rest of his body followed suit sinking inward as the apocalypse reached up to his neck. He could feel the pain, anguish, and despair in every grain of this graveyard. The lives lost sang in unison. Ah, oh, beautiful, he thought. It put his mind to rest. The Skull Kid closed his eyes and took it in as instructed. The coarse, dark feeling of death rubbed against his skin and got into his clothes, and the Skull Kid relished it. After a moment of peaceful bathing, he reached through the destruction with his mind. He tried to find the other hosts to connect to. Then, Link was in two places at once. He was bathing in the ashes through the imp's mind, but he was also walking across Termina Field. His Termina Field body stopped abruptly in the long grass. Clock Town was in his peripheral. The imp from the Graveyard of Ashes shifted uneasily as he joined the confusing symphony. The Skull Kid sensed a powerful healer's cave, too. Dark Link felt incredible power suddenly coursing through its body, unaware of the hero's presence as the imp offered a blessing. Dark Link's eyes turned from red to purple, and the shadow looked to see a group of Tektites huddled in the grass. Oh, something to try this newfound blessing on. Dark Link thought. The Skull Kid twitched. He could feel the mask become uneasy. Why is there another? Majora said. Who is already in our head? Dark Link shot out its hand, and purple flames burst forth. 
No more bows, arrows, and swords. This felt good. Very good. The shadow liked the newfound power, gleeful as the Skull Kid's blessing consumed the Tektites. The monster's bestial screams echoed alongside the ashes beyond Snowhead. Stop this, Majora said, not sharing in Darkling's joy. The boy, how is the boy here? He can see through us, but I can't see through him. Dark Link was the only happy party among the four. The shadow laughed merrily as it killed, ecstatic to be walking to Snowhead. Once there, Majora would teach it how to tap into this newfound magic whenever it wanted. The mixture of light and dark would finally be Dark Link's to command at will. However, the shadow stammered. A burning began in the shadow's chest. <sighs> light, it realized. Light magic was beginning to overpower the dark. Dark Link didn't understand, its joy fleeting as the Tektite's legs curled upward in death. We must end this, Majora said. Kill the boy while he's with us. Consume his mind. Tattle sat solemnly at the pool's edge. She stared into the clear water's remaining purity, only partially tainted by darkness. The great fairy remained over the water, eyes closed in concentration. Link hovered in place, still frozen within the fairy's corrupted magic that encircled him. He looked terrifying in his partial, motionless possession. The hero's jaw was practically unhinged, wide open as it released a scream that had been silenced. Can he see us? Tattle thought. Or is he seeing through the skull kid now? She hoped neither was true. She hoped he was asleep. Guilt fell heavy upon Tattle. She talked him into this, and she recalled their last few conversations. There was nothing extremely bad about them, but... It's been awkward, Tattle thought. Ever since we learned all those terrible things from the masked salesman. The fairy hated feeling lesser than Link, as some alleged shadow of another fairy. And Link thought he could fix everything by simply reassuring her things were fine. But they're not, Tattle thought. And now I might never get to talk to him about them again. She yearned for another chance to fix their friendship. Now her friend looked like a monster, consumed by evil and frozen in time. Link had become a dark deity, power-hungry to dominate everything in his path. There has to be something we can do, Tattle said, finally turning to the great fairy. Or is your plan to wait until he finally overcomes your spell and kills us? There's nothing we can do, the great fairy explained. He must find the light and overcome the darkness within him. But he can't do that alone! There has to be some way we can help him! The great fairy glanced at the imprisoned boy, appearing deep in thought. How much do you value this boy's life? More than anything! She said, only recognizing it to be the truth after she spoke it. I would do whatever it takes to get him back. The great fairy turned those words over and eventually nodded. Very well, but the only path forward risks your own corruption. Tattle had figured as much. She nodded anyways. I can connect your consciousness to Lynx, the great fairy said. That way, you could speak to him within his prison and attempt to call him back. But I must warn you, Link may be gone already. I don't know whose spirit resides in him now. All I know is that there is darkness, and he may be too far gone to be brought back. It would be immensely dangerous for you to try rescuing him. Tettle looked at the frozen boy one more time. He would do this for me. The fairy thought. Just like he saved me in Great Bay. She wouldn't abandon him now, either. I don't care, Tuttle said. I'll do it, right now, before it's too late. Then I wish, I wish you good fortune, the great fairy said, floating closer to them. Look him in the eyes. Fly to be face to face. Tuttle cautiously did, finding his corrupted eyes hard to meet. Now, let, let yourself, yourself go, 
surrender yourself to my magic and speak to your friend once more. At first, Tattle felt nothing. She watched Link expecting some horrible pain or surprise. The fairy opened her mouth to ask what to do, but then she was on a farm that wasn't Romani's ranch or anywhere that she knew in Termina. Lush grass basked in the sun's rich warmth, and Tattle blinked away the midday. She found Link as his normal self, but injured still. He seemed so weak, pale, and ghost-like. He clashed with the world's brightness, staring at two other people who lay in the grass nearby. One of them looked exactly like Link, except much younger and healthier. A girl with long blonde hair lay beside him. The older, present-day Link was a phantom watching in mourning. Link! Tattle said, flying up to his shrunken older self. He didn't pay her any attention. Instead, he stared at his childhood, and whom Tattle presumed to be Zelda. Um, Link! I'm here! You have to wake up! Oh, he said in hardly a whisper. Everyone's dead. I'm not! Tattle said. Link, I'm right here! We must end this. Majora's dark voice cut through the fragile dream, threatening to tear the reality open. Kill the boy while he's with us. Consume his mind. Link didn't seem to notice Majora. He only stared longingly at his lost companion. Link! Tattle tried again. We have to go! The scene shifted. Link watched his younger self mourn over Zelda's body, which lay in her royal bed. Both versions of himself cried as tears rolled across a rosy and pale face alike. Older Link looked nearly as dead as the princess. Link, it'll be okay, Tattle said, shifting uncomfortably in the castle bedroom's memory. Zelda's gone, but I'm right here. She tried to reach out for him, but an infinite gulf of something seemed to hold her back. Darkness, she thought. It's Majora. It won't be okay, Link said, finally addressing her with his ghostly voice. You're dead too, Navi. Suddenly, they were in a forest. The masked salesman stared into Epona's eyes with the re-dead mask's grip, freezing her. From atop his steed, Link looked confused between the masked captor and someone else. That someone else was a fairy, glowing a familiar shade of white to her own. The masked salesman turned away from Epona, who immediately regained movement and flung Link off. The re-dead mask then turned to Navi and froze her. The monster and fairy locked eyes for what seemed like the longest time. Then, her neck was forcibly twisted in the wrong direction. The scene passed into a new one again. Now, the masked salesman mourned over the dead fairy he'd killed, clutching her lifeless body as he cried. Link watched while lying against a gray, weathered shack's outer wall. The other, older Link watched too, crying in the distance like the masked salesman. Tattle found herself fighting back her own tears. Link! That's not me! That's Navi! I'm right here, and I'm still alive! End him! Get him out! They were underneath the clock tower and the masked salesman spoke menacingly. <laughs> These aren't real people, Link. Stop pretending there's something they're not. It was the night of the final day. The tower's cogs turned along with the waterway below. Tattle could feel the darkness creeping in from everywhere. I love her! Link cried out. Then your then love, love is misplaced. Is misplaced. A, shadow a shadow doesn't have a heart. Don't listen to him, Link! Tattle said, ignoring the flashback and flying directly into present-day Link's face. Come back to me! Don't let it kill you! You're just a shadow! Link said with newfound anger. The scenes around them faded into a void of colors. The scenes and memories blurred together, swirling around them in a cacophony of heartache and despair. You know that's not true! Tattle said, fighting as hard as she could to calm herself. So much death. It was all a horrible tornado of grief around them. 
It's like you said when we first crawled out of those ashes. There is something worth saving. I... I know that now. I know that because I really care about you, Link. And I know that you care about me too. It doesn't matter what I am or what this place really is. All that matters is that we care about each other. Link turned to face her for the first time, appearing so lost. But everyone's gone, he said. I let everyone that I love die. I failed to save them. Why am I rescuing a world that doesn't matter? It does matter, Link. There's something special about this place that we haven't discovered yet. I can feel it, and not everyone's gone. She flew into his shoulder and hugged him, shutting out the horrible memories. I'm still here, remember? You saved me, just like you said you would, just like you promised. The next scene to play was the two of them underneath the trap door in Woodfall Temple. It cut through the sounds of the dying, returning them to the evening before their battle with Odalwa. They'd sat there, waiting for the moon to kill them, unaware that the monkeys would soon save them. Well, you know what, Tattle? Link said, sitting up against their small prison's wall. What? I think, I know, that I'm glad I'm here with you right now. Tuttle scoffed. But what about Hyrule and Zelda? Wouldn't you rather be there? No, Link answered. Because I wasn't done in Termina yet. I decided not to leave this place until I save it, even if that meant dying, which obviously it did. And there's no one I'd rather have with me in this final hour than you. As Link watched the flashback, he pulled Tattle closer. The hug provided all the warmth he needed then. She's right, Link thought. I haven't lost everyone. I still have her. I still have Tattle. Suddenly, Tattle was in the fountain again. She blinked the visions away, and Link came into view. The frozen boy finally drew a deep, heavy breath. His eyes and hair returned to normal. The purple strands of dark magic faded, too. He fell into the water, splashing in its renewed purity as he scrambled to his feet. The hero looked around dazedly, finding an uncertain expression on the great fairy's face. She leaned forward as if inspecting him to make sure he'd truly been cleansed. Link's breathing steadied, and he soon turned to face his friend. Daddle! Blue eyes shone back up at her. Majora's influence was gone. She smiled, flying into his shoulder to hug him again, as they had in the dream. You're back! She said. Link embraced her, taking stock of his renewed strength. He felt incredible. All signs of injury and fatigue had vanished. The Great Fairy of Magic had healed him. The Great Fairy finally smiled from behind them. This victory is yours, and yours alone. I acted only as a guide. The darkness feeds off sadness and despair. When Tattle braved the nightmares to save you, she became a champion of the light. You both must be willing to fight the battle within before you can fight the one without. Link let go of Tattle, wiping tears of happiness away. So, it's done then. I've beaten it? He could still feel the scar on his chest, which made him uncertain. It was the only injury not completely healed. Even though he'd survived, he could still feel that deep, unsettling satisfaction the same one he got whenever Majora possessed him. The darkness still grows within you, the great fairy said grimly. But always keep this in mind, young one. There is both light and dark in that scar of yours. The Skull Kid and Majora's influence is only one part of it. Who does the light magic belong to? The great fairy shook her head. I do not know. But never, never forget, forget that it is there. When Link looked at Tattle next, he found her still smiling. I think we're back to normal, he realized. Finally, after the horrible things from Snowhead. 
The hero hadn't felt this light in such a long time. Thank you for everything, Link said one last time to the great fairy. When we finally stop Majora, it'll be thanks to you too. Your collective courage was inspiring, she said, and I remain a faithful servant. Come see me again whenever your quest has made you weary. When Link re-entered South Clock Town, he was hardly recognizable. His green tunic was repaired, his bandages were removed, and his boots rested snugly over his feet again. His scabbard was on his back and the weight of his gilded sword felt reassuring. His bag sat over his shoulders with his few surviving possessions, as well as his ocarina on his belt. All that remained missing was his shield and his hat. The former had been left behind at the ranch, and the latter had been blown away in the chaos of Great Bay's destruction. Regardless, he felt reborn, with Tattle by his side. I feel so amazing, Link said, beaming up at Tattle in the middle of Termina's sunny midday. I told you the Great Fairy knew what she was doing, Tattle said. We're officially back, Link said, walking across the plaza. And this time, there won't be a masked salesman to take you away from me. Thank Nehru, she said. He always creeps me out. <laughs> That's an understatement, Link said, pausing. But before we go back to saving giants, there are a few things we should do. Like? Buy a shield, for one, and another bow. Then find my horse and maybe try to help Romani and Kremia. Link? That all, the hero said, already knowing what she planned to say. We owe it to them. And besides, helping people is the only way we've made progress. The fairy sighed, though with less bitterness than she had over Woodfall's excursions. <sighs> Fair enough, fairy boy. After that, let's head west. If we can handle being on that beach again. Oof, I don't want to any more than you do. Link said, mourning what could have been a sunny vacation had the shoreline not already been plagued with horrible memories. Best to get it out of the way. The Skull Kid sat at the edge of the Plain of Ashes, shaking. Majora had gotten mad. Very, very mad. It scared him when Majora got mad. You let him live. Majora said. You let him escape. I... I tried, the imp said, stammering. I channeled as much darkness into him as I could, but... but... he... he got out and... This is unacceptable. You are unacceptable. If you fail me again, I will let him kill you. And the dark servant, the shadow, will take your place. Skull Kid's eyes widened. When the shadow arrives, you will train it, and you will make it the perfect servant of corruption. Let the shadow use my magic to do what it was made for, killing 